Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Friday, April 14th. Derek Van Riper here with Al Melchior. On this episode, we dig into a rash of injuries around the league and the fallout that will lead us to be on the waiver wire in a very active way this weekend. We're always looking for value, always looking for upgrades, but this seems more like just finding replacements in many cases. If you avoided the injury bug this week, maybe play the lottery this weekend because it seems like everybody is dealing with it in some way. Form. And there's actually some pretty interesting players to consider picking up as a result of all of this fallout. So, uh, Al, I don't know. How did, how did you weather the storm overall? Your team's still kind of in one piece for the most part? I think I've gotten pretty lucky. So maybe I, I do need to go and you know buy, buy some scratchers or something uh, this evening. So uh, the one thing I did was I was a little worried about Carlos Correa. Of course, he was back with the Twins on Thursday night, but I went out in the league where I have Correa and got Orlando Arcia as insurance. Mm. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I I got hit a little bit there, but uh, yeah, I think if yeah, if you've got a shortstop that's healthy, uh, you you might be in the minority. Yeah, I, maybe we'll start there because it, it's we talked about this a little bit earlier in the week. It is a thin position on the waiver wire, and it got even thinner because Orlando Arcia was the kind of player that people would have been looking at. This weekend, potentially, in some 12-team leagues just to fill in, just to keep things afloat. Corey Seager got hurt this week, so there's a, a major injury there. So tons of people out there looking for some help, at least in the middle infield. Because you may have a middle infielder that can play shortstop in, in Seager's place if Seager's on your team. But then going to that middle infield pool and trying to find some value, uh, it's not looking great. Now, for Atlanta, there may be a built-in replacement, at least if you don't need someone who's shortstop eligible right away. Vaughn Grissom is back up. So uh, he was an easy early season cut for me going into the year just because I didn't know how long we were going to have to wait for him. And I figured if it was more than a week or two, the payoff probably wasn't going to be there. I needed to go ahead and, and turn that roster spot. Uh, if you look at what he did at AAA, 10 games at that level, was having a really nice start to the season. A 366, 458, 585 line, a homer, a couple of steals, six walks against four strikeouts. So all good things. As much as Von Grissom could do to force the issue, at least with his bat, he was doing that at AAA Gwinnett. The problem was Orlando Arcia was also playing well. Now with Arcia hurt, the window is open, it seems, for Grissom to carve out a role and, and maybe prove that he just deserves to stick on this roster. I, I think it's it's something we expected over the course of the winter when we first started hearing that he was going to make the move to shortstop, that he would just win the job. I think the question now is, can he actually do enough to push Arcia to a super sub role? I think he could. Uh, in fact, I was surprised, and I think other people were, when Arcia won the role outright coming out of spring training. But it's a hard situation to read. And so I had to sort of parse this for the waiver wire column because I did recommend Grissom as a replacement. I think at least in the short run, he's probably the best option you have out there if you're trying to fill, uh, at, at least in the near term, maybe an MI slot or if you can hang on and wait for him to get a shortstop eligibility, you'll be able to use him there uh, you know, pretty quickly, I think. But I don't know how this plays out long term, given that the, the organization saw fit to give the job to RC in the first place. I don't know. I don't know uh, how these two uh, players wind up surviving on the roster together and, and getting playing time. So maybe you're right. Maybe it's Arcia getting getting a uh, super utility role and and maintaining a lot of the the playing time that he had over the first two weeks. Like you said, he was hitting very well, uh, so he certainly didn't do anything other than get hurt to lose the job. So yeah, in the short run, I, I do like Grissom as a as a fantasy replacement. Again, am I uh, am I slot being your your best hope there? I think if you want to look at Atlanta's depth chart and, and find the soft spots where playing time could still be available several weeks from now as more players get healthy, as eventually RC is going to come back. They're calling this injury a micro fracture in his left wrist. They didn't provide a timetable with the initial press release. So I don't know if it's going to be a lot more than the minimum or just a little more than the minimum. Uh, but if you bring RC back even in, in two weeks, you could say that maybe left field is still a revolving door, right? Eddie Rosario. Yeah, to this point, 11 games. It's a 229, 273, 71 line for him. Uh, just one homer so far, seven Ks and 37 plate appearances. That's not really cutting it. So maybe the pressure is on him to start hitting a little bit more to keep his role. And then, of course, uh, Marcelo Zuna, who I think we were looking at throughout the winter and saying, 
this might be the end of his time in Atlanta. He's got a couple of home runs, Al, but 13 Ks and 41 plate appearances, a 445 OPS. So you have two guys who are getting pretty significant playing time, not in the middle infield, but if you're willing to move Grissom around a little bit or willing to move RC around a little bit, you do have a significant share of playing time that's up for grabs. So I think you have to be a little creative to see how it works, but I think it it can happen. So we don't talk a lot about bids specifically on the podcast because every situation is different, but I do think you can be a little aggressive with Von Grissom if you have to be. I think he does make sense as a bit of a priority add in the middle infield. If you said you know, 8 to 10% of a fab budget on Grissom, I don't think I'd push back on that. I, I can understand that. Like I said, I, I kind of had to parse the situation carefully i didn't make a bid uh a bid recommendation for him uh very not strategically but but put him in the intro <laughs> where i don't get it into that <laughs> those details as much i if that's what's going to take and quite likely i think will be uh like an eight percent ish bid i probably won't get grissom anywhere this weekend because i do worry a little bit about how playing time will work out for him in the longer run and there are other options available i mean if you like grissom for for batting average or maybe for steals potential. Um, John Birdie can certainly handle the steals part of that. Gio Urshela could handle the, uh, the the batting average part of that. So there are some other other hitters out there. Uh, Brandon Crawford's off to a, a kind of a, a nice start in terms of his peripherals. So that's somebody else that I included in the column as a, a potential shortstop replacement. So I think with a number of players out there who can fulfill certain categorical needs, I'd probably wouldn't be going more than 5% on Grissom, but he has, he has the combination that, that other players don't necessarily have. So if you want to take the risk of, of the longer term playing time issue, then I, I think 8% is appropriate. Yeah. I think you mentioned a few good contingency options. If Grissom is available and those older veterans are available, I would go ahead and throw those backup bids in accordingly. The other player with shortstop eligibility who is seeing more time recently that I think is a little bit interesting is Jose Barrero. I don't think I would spend more than about a min bid to get him. If you look at what he's done through the first 10 games, it's uh, nothing off the charts. He's got a home run. He's driven in five, only six Ks and 30 plate appearances though, which is a really good sign for him because Jose Barrero last year with the Reds struck out 76 times in 174 plate appearances. So a pretty big improvement for him. He's always been toolsy. He's got power. He's got some speed. The Reds have some opportunities for now. He's kind of stuck in the bottom of that lineup, but he's played nearly every day for the past week. So there's one more name for you if you're just desperate in a deeper league trying to find some help uh, to take over at the shortstop position specifically. Now, the other question here is, do you see anyone in Texas with Seager sort of being the prompt here and along with Arcia? Seager missing four weeks puts the Rangers in a pretty difficult spot. Is it Josh Smith's job to lose in the interim. I know he's eligible, I believe, at third base and outfield in a lot of leagues right now, so he'll add shortstop here in the near future. Uh, but what do you make of, of Josh Smith getting this opportunity? Is he a cheap speed option for deep mixed leagues, or is he more of a mono league play for the time being? I think you could go cheap speed in, in deeper mixed leagues, uh, but I you know I don't view that as a, a huge endorsement. That still puts him at the back of the list uh, that I was was starting before. So, uh, yeah, I just, I think he's pretty much a one dimensional player for fantasy purposes. And I, I just worry about him even hitting and getting on base enough to, to consistently deliver with steals. So he's sort of a last resort, but the, the steals potential does give him some deep league, uh, some deep mixed league appeal. Let's talk about an option in the middle infield in Minnesota. So if you don't need a shortstop specifically, Edward Julien is up for the Twins. Now, I think this is another situation that you look at and you wonder, where does he fit as you look at the longer-term picture? Is he up for good? Is he at least a big side platoon sort of volume play? Like Really good numbers in the minors from Julian. Left-handed bat, Jorge Polanco currently on the IL with that knee injury, and... It, is, is it more of a temporary solution or is it similar to the Grissom where it's there's enough moving parts on this depth chart where you could actually see Julian maybe carving out a role even beyond the eventual return of Jorge Polanco? I think it's it's sort of analogous to the, the Braves situation uh, in that, not that I necessarily see a clear path for Julian to stay up and, and play a lot, but that the, the talent is there uh, already off to a good start homered in his first game. Uh, but I think that 
you know, there could be a way for him to, to, to play, but it would involve again, a lot of the, you know, players kind of moving around. I think Nick Gordon is kind of the key here because when you have Joey Gallo and Max Kepler coming back, possibly as soon as next week, then that would ostensibly push him into second base more as a full-time thing and less as a utility player. But if they're, if the twins want to keep Julian up, then I think that that pushes Gordon out of the picture. So that to me is like kind of the one-on-one matchup there is Gordon versus Julianne. Who are they going to go with? Gordon's not off to a good start in terms of surface level stats, but uh, a stat that I dug up yesterday while researching the column, Gordon's only struck out one time so far in something, I think close to 40 plate appearances. I don't know if he struck out yesterday, but prior to the game, he had just one strikeout on the season, but he had something like a one eighteen average. So uh, you know, I don't know how much uh, front offices take that sort of thing into account and say, you know, they look at the the surface stats, but say, oh, you know, there's there's good things going on underneath. Uh, let's let's give them a little bit more run. But, you know, with with Julian in the picture now, I think that definitely speeds up the timetable for Gordon to to put something together. Yeah, and I think the other thing I want to see with with Julian, I know he played pretty much entirely at second base last year, including his time in the Fall League. So between Double A and the Fall League, everything was at second base. But in 2021, at a lower level, we actually saw Julian play some first base. We saw him play kind of second and third. We saw him play some uh, left field at high A back in that season. So maybe a little more flexibility, even if he's not necessarily a great defender at many of those spots. We'll see if the Twins actually trust him to move around because that would make him an even bigger threat to Nick Gordon's playing time. If they believe in in the glove or they're willing to absorb any shortcomings of that glove to get that offense in their lineup, then Julianne, I think, could be the higher ceiling play than Nick Gordon. So it's possible. I, I think comparing it to the Atlanta situation makes a lot of sense just given that uh, the role could be carved out in the weeks ahead. As far as the other Twins news that I saw that I thought was worth mentioning on this episode, Alex Kirloff has started a rehab assignment. That's another complicating factor just because Kirloff will be in that first base and outfield mix. And my expectation for him is that he'll be a regular part of the Twins plans once he's healthy enough to to have a role. So in addition to Gallo coming back, Polanco eventually coming back, Kirloff is on his way back. Kyle Farmer's on the aisle right now after getting hit in the face with a pitch. So he might be out for a couple of weeks. But this is a Twins team that's really banged up right now. Max Kepler, who you mentioned, also down right now. Uh, So as players come back, that's always going to lead to a a decision for someone to maybe get pushed off the roster. And that's the one thing that could also work against Edward Julian is having minor league options left. A lot of the older players on this roster don't have those options. Julian does. So keep that in mind, too, if you're using him as at least a stopgap in the middle infield. There's a a whole variety of ways this can actually play out for him. With Kirilov, I think they're waiting for him to play him back-to-back games on his rehab assignment before they activate it, but he could be back before the end of the month based on some of the timetables that we have been seeing. Uh, let's get to some other matters here. I think the the most intriguing player of the week is actually on the pitching side. It's Taj Bradley, Al. We talked about him a little bit on the Thursday episode. Really did well in Eno's you know, pitching model. Good results in that first start earlier this week against the Red Sox. And now, thanks to a Jeffrey Springs injury on top of a Zach Eflin injury, it seems much more likely that Taj Bradley is going to get a handful of starts in the near future instead of just the spot start. He was optioned down after that mm-hmm. debut, but the Springs injury happened after Taj Bradley was sent down. So that probably changes the Rays' plans quite a bit. Um, I think maybe this could be like a George Kirby pickup from a year ago. I think this is a very polished young pitcher that... I didn't want to stash him necessarily in pre-draft leagues because I didn't know how long it was going to take for him to get the call from the Rays. But because of these injuries piling up really quickly, he might be able to take that last spot in the rotation once everyone's healthy and just stay up all season. Well, if we look at it long term, I still it'll be really interesting to see what the Rays do. And you'll, I mean, they're they're just loaded with pitching, which is partly why they they don't lose games. But I have to wonder that when you've got the full complement back, you've got Glass now back. Um, that maybe Zach Eflin goes to the bullpen because otherwise I don't I don't know where there's room for Bradley and I'm maybe I'm getting ahead of myself because this is several weeks down the line but it's just you know to me an interesting question and I think it does does impact maybe how aggressively you go go on fab because you certainly don't want to go 10 11 12 percent on somebody that maybe is is getting yo-yoed back and forth but I think Bradley's better than deserving that fate 
So I think they'll find some way. And so I actually do think it'd be more likely that uh, if, if everybody somehow does remain healthy, uh, which is a, a, you know, a great problem to have that maybe Eflin is, is the odd guy out, which is, you know, it's just weird to think <laughs> that your rotation is that good, but uh, they'll, they'll, I think they'll find a way to keep Bradley up there. Yeah. Health permitting their I think their best five this year is going to be McClanahan, Glassnow, Springs, Rasmussen, and probably Bradley over Eflin, but they could just go to six if they wanted to yeah. and just keep everybody's innings down because they've got so many injuries on their key rotation members over time. And Drew Rasmussen's a, a two-time Tommy John surgery recipient. Um, you know, Springs having the elbow injury now, Glass now coming off the oblique, McClanahan having some concerns about his arm late last season. It might make sense to give these guys extra rest and then shorten the rotation in September or in the playoffs. Um, I, I think as long as they're relying on someone like Josh Fleming every fifth day, you could look at Taj Bradley and see an upgrade right there. So, you know, the current state of things makes me sort of say, let's play for the next three to four weeks. I think you can be pretty aggressive with those Bradley bids as well, even with some downside, because someone else could get hurt, even if the other guys call come back healthy. And we might get an actual timetable on Springs. He was scheduled for an MRI today. So once the results of that MRI are known, then we may have a better sense for how long his absence is going to be for now. It just seems like an IL stint is looming and it's a matter of time before the Rays actually have to make that decision. But uh, Yanni Chirino's up right now. They're shuffling bullpen arms around. We saw uh, we saw someone get a, a save on this Rays team. Braden Bristow had a save in his big league debut, but it was a three-inning save. He threw like 42 pitches, and I think with Springs being hurt especially, they're just trying to uh, have as many fresh arms available as possible in that pen. So Yanni Chirino's sort of taking on the, the bulk role for the time being for Tampa Bay. So no need to be excited about him just yet, but a lot could change with this team here in the next 48 hours or so. So be sure to keep an eye on the news before fab actually runs on Sunday night. Let's talk about Dre Jamison though, because I think Dre Jamison is also in a pretty good situation right now. He has shifted into the rotation thanks to Zach Davies injury. And if you want to try and forecast a longer opportunity for him, Madison Bumgarner just looks finished every time he comes up. It looks like more of the same. Uh, Jameson, I think, wanted to actually pitch even more than he did in that first start, and I'm sure the, the Diamondbacks are going to be careful about stretching him out against. He was working in the bullpen to begin the season, but um, how, how much more interested are you in Bradley than Jameson, or is it actually pretty close, just given that Jameson may have a, a longer, a, a clearer path to the longer opportunity? I, I'm more interested in Bradley. Uh, I just I just like the potential more. I think more of a strikeout, uh, you know, he has more of a, a strikeout history. And I, I think that, um, I think certainly the the quality of the Rays depth is, is not only, you know, better than the Diamondbacks. I mean, it's, it's probably unparalleled right now in the major leagues, uh, but the Diamondbacks there, you know, once you get Brandon fought up there, they're going to have some, some decisions to make too. And, you know, while it might seem like the obvious thing to, uh, take Baumgartner out of the rotation to not bring Zach Davies back into the rotation whenever he's ready to return. Uh, you know that things aren't always that that simple. So I think it could be a crowded situation. I'm not completely confident that that Jamison doesn't get moved back to the bullpen at some point. But at least in the short term, I yeah, I would certainly like to add him uh, 15 teamers with a, a, a low bid, uh, maybe in, in 12 teamers. But uh, yeah, they're both they're both pretty exciting pitchers. I think when we mentioned Jamison last week, he, he was interesting because he had a chance to vulture some saves. He was working in a multi-inning relief role, also a chance to pick up some wins in, in that usage. I don't think that goes away. If he gets bumped from the rotation later on, he may still be very rosterable and usable as a multi-inning reliever just based on how, how well he was pitching to begin the year. Uh, if you're thinking about him for the upcoming week, the D-backs let him throw 54 pitches against the Brewers in his last start, so he went four innings. Usually teams are willing to bump a guy about 15 pitches from his previous outing. Mm -hmm. So you're probably looking at something in the range of 70 or maybe 75 pitches if they want to be a little more aggressive. He threw 66 pitches back on March 31st, his first appearance of the season, went four innings against the Dodgers. Um, so you're just trying to make plans for the short term. It may be another start or two before Jamison could actually go six innings and, and be worked like a regular starter. But I think he's pretty intriguing from a skills perspective. I'm definitely in. Like you, I've got Bradley ahead of him, even though Jamison's spot, at least on the big league roster, looks a bit more stable right now. I wanted to ask you if you were going to speculate, though, on any of the Guardians' young starting pitchers, because Aaron Savali is down with an oblique injury. Tristan McKenzie is already hurt. 
Peyton Battenfield got the first opportunity, and we talked about him on Tuesday. Not really a guy that has the ceiling that a lot of the other Guardians starting pitching prospects have. So is this the time, if you're into Tanner Bybee or you're into Gavin Williams or if you're into Logan Allen, are you trying to stash them this weekend, even if we don't have any sort of confirmation that one of those guys is going to join the rotation next week? It's not a bad idea. Uh, the one that I would really focus on is Bybee. I think he'd be the next one up. And uh, it, it certainly would require less fab to do it this weekend, barring an announcement between now and then, uh, than it would be uh, when there is an announcement if that comes down the line. So, yeah, if, if you got the room to, to stash Bybee, I think he's one of those pitchers, you know, sort of like like Taj Bradley. Like he could have been drafted as a, as a late rounder. Um He's somebody that's worth stashing if you're in the sort of league that gives you enough spots to to not make that a you know a drag on your roster. So yeah, I probably wouldn't go more than maybe three percent because I just I again barring any kind of announcement between now and, and Sunday, I, I I think it's probably not gonna take more than that. Yeah, I think you can save a lot of fab if you've got the roster spot to play with. It takes a certain type of league, of course, for players in the minor leagues to be available for pickup at this time. But uh, Bivy has a, a, sh- a shallow mixed league impact ceiling. He would be on the same level for me as Taj Bradley if we knew he was joining the rotation next week. So keep that in mind as well when you're trying to evaluate Bivy against some of the options currently on your bench. Another injury that shook things up this week, Brandon Woodruff on the 15-day IL right now due to some shoulder soreness. Uh, we saw Jansen Junk make a spot start. I believe that was actually in Woodruff's place, but then we actually saw Colin Ray start for the Brewers on Thursday in San Diego. And Colin Ray pitched pretty well, uh, went to Japan for all of 2022, started pitching there in 2021. Wasn't overpowering, but just seemed like he he commanded his arsenal pretty well. I think uh, William Contreras was kind of helping him steal some strikes behind the plate. So maybe there's a, a little bit of good luck cooked into that line for Colin Ray, but he seems like the preferred option over Jansen Junk to continue in the rotation until Woodruff comes back. So any interest in Colin Ray as a, a bit of a journeyman getting a, a brief look here from the Brewers? At this point, I would say just NL only. I was just really surprised. I, I'll be honest, I didn't know he was in the Brewers system. I didn't know he was back in Major League Baseball. So when I saw his his name there in the probables, uh, I was like, He's still pitching. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think of him as the guy that uh, the the Marlins wound up trading back to the Padres right after they got him because uh, he, he got, I think, I think he had Tommy John, if I recall, but he got hurt in the first start that he had um, when the Marlins tried to trade Luis Castillo the first time. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, look, look that trade up. Uh, if you have a, a, a chance, that, that's a, that's another head scratching uh, trade uh, that was made even weirder by the fact that the Marlins had to send Ray back. But uh, yeah, so it was long way of saying I would definitely uh, pick Ray up in, in NL only and watch the next start at least. Uh, and maybe think about him for 15 teamers. Yeah. I think the, the extent of my interest is probably mono leagues at this point, but um, if, if you have Woodruff, you're scrambling for innings, I was looking for some different options, and I didn't see a ton out there. I think one of the one of the more interesting pitchers that's been on the mentioned on the show a few times already this season, who's still out there at least in some twelve team leagues, is Brad Keller. I think he's been maybe one of your best shots at at getting a, a three or four start stretch that somehow comes close to typical Woodruff numbers, thanks to some of the adjustments that he's made. We're seeing Brad Keller just closer to a strikeout per inning again, 16 Ks and in 17 innings, sitting with a 212 ERA and a 112 whip. New pitch mix going a very long way for him. Um, and he's gone five and two thirds and six and two thirds now in his last couple of outings too. So you're not worried about depth. A lot of the starting pitchers you're looking at from week to week on the waiver wire have a lot of questions about how much they can pitch into games. Brad Keller's never really had that. And now Brad Keller's got a few more weapons that he can work with in his arsenal that I think has made him a much more interesting pitcher. So uh, credit to him for for making those changes because I just looked at Brad Keller going into the season as an afterthought. I didn't really want him anywhere, even in, in draft and hold leagues. I just thought he was the kind of starter that you could do better speculating on someone who didn't have a job. And it turns out the adjustments he's made have sort of maybe saved his career here at age 27. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. You said age 27, it sure seems like he's been around a long time, but you know, he, he has, and yet he's, he's still just 27. And I, do you think there's a good reason for me to be skeptical of Brad Keller, but less skeptical of Chris Bubich? Cause I, 
I made what I thought were some pretty aggressive big bids on Bubich in a lot of leagues and wound up empty <laughs> in all of them. So the bidding on Bubich is really crazy. I totally under, you know, understand it. I was, I didn't have winning bids, but I, I didn't lose by much. Uh, but I think it's just the longer track record for Keller that just, it's making me a lot more reluctant to put that kind of fab behind it. So maybe I'll put in a couple, couple dollars this weekend. Uh, but I don't know. Um, that, so the longer track record is not something that's a concern for you. So I guess the way you're, yeah, the way you're framing this is we've seen enough bad. We've seen more Brad, bad Brad Keller. Then we've seen bad Chris Bubich. Therefore, it, it, he, he has more to prove. It's a longer distance to cover to show us that this is, in fact, um, you know, like a, a real sustainable change. That's that's more or less the argument. That is more or less the argument. And as you you uh, very nicely you restated that, I'm thinking, okay, who who can I think of who has been around as long as Keller has and has made that kind of improvement at that stage of his career. And just because I can't think of somebody in 30 seconds doesn't mean that that person isn't out there. But I, I'm, you know, I nobody comes right to mind that's made that kind of transition. Whereas, you know, I think of like a Lucas Giolito who had a couple of rough years, but, you know, put it together very nicely. And, uh, you know, OK, I could see Chris Bubich following that that kind of trajectory. But who is the analog for Brad Keller? And maybe he is a unicorn. Doesn't mean somebody had to model it before him, but. It would make me feel a little better if I could think of somebody who did. Well, okay. I, I was just thinking about Charlie Morton yesterday, the beginning of his career versus the like the first half of Charlie Morton's career, which had a lot of injuries, but he was a low strikeout rate kind of power sinker guy. And then he ended up becoming more of a sort of strikeouts. The stuff ticked up in the back half of his career, and he completely you know, rewrote everything we thought we knew about him. That's a great analogy. It happens. It, it's... It's hard to, in the moment, as, as it's beginning, it's always hard to bet on it. And something Eno brought up with the pitching model that I think is really really kind of important with Keller and maybe the thing that would separate him from Bubich or would give you a reason to be more optimistic or just as optimistic about Keller as you are about Bubich is that Brad Keller has two above-average breaking balls now. The slider came in at a 137 in the stuff plus model. That's way above average. The curveball is at 114, and the fastball is not bad. And when you have two above average breaking pitches a fastball that doesn't hurt you and you can locate pitches that makes you pretty dangerous so i think there's enough here with both of these guys to, to continue pushing after them in even more shallow formats i think bubich was the the bigger ad last week keller we're still available is going to probably sneak in a few pretty big bids uh, i think if you were if you were excited about tyler mcgill at the beginning of last season or even the beginning of this season Brad Keller is at least on that sort of level, right? I mean, you're going to use him in many of his starts, well, most of but, his home starts. Yeah, but that's that to me is sort of the the thing that supports my skepticism because there was a lot of excitement around Tyler McGill, and yet he hasn't really delivered on it yet. Yeah, part of that I think is he got hurt though. Yeah. So I'm in. I'm in on Brad Keller. I never thought I would be, but I actually think looking at a lot of my my shallow mixed leagues, I've got plenty of, of Brandon Woodruff on my teams. Um, Keller is going to have to be uh, kind of a, a port in the storm for a little while for me, at least. Even if it's just a couple of weeks where I'm using him for all of his starts, that might be good enough to, to get by. Uh, next turn, I believe, comes against the Rangers again. You just saw the Rangers. What's with this schedule? Nevertheless, I am uh, in. And up the following week, it's a two-star week for Keller. So even if you're a little more skeptical, if you trust him at home against the Rangers and you trust them enough to use him in a two-star week, it could be sort of a pitch and ditch thing, kind of throwing a tip of the cap to the old fantasy 411 show where you use him for these next two lineup periods in weekly leagues and then you reevaluate things two weeks from now when more of your roster will likely be hurt or some of your injured players will be back. The, the, the picture will look completely different by then. Well, I, you know, yeah, that's a good approach and... I'll be interested to see what the bids are on Keller and see if other people are uh, thinking the same way that I am. And I'm, I'm kind of hoping they are because, yeah, I wouldn't mind taking that kind of uh, approach with, with Keller this weekend. Um, but, yeah, I'm just I don't see going in as aggressively as I did with uh, with Bubich. I'm finding that the streamers this week are a little bit light. I don't know if it's because of the way the schedule is working out where you just don't have a lot of layups from from guys who are available 
or what exactly the cause of this is. But there is one more name that I think is pretty interesting, even if you don't like him from a skills perspective that much. I actually think he's okay from a skills perspective. It's Tyler Wells. He has a matchup against the Tigers. 11 innings pitched in his first two starts. I believe he goes again tonight. So you'll get a third start from him before Fab actually runs this weekend. And I think what's catching my eye with Tyler Wells, aside from the fact that the Orioles just look better in general, so the team around him is more likely to provide run support, and I think even the bullpen's even a little bit improved, so his leads are a little bit safer. The usage has changed. Tyler Wells threw 89 pitches against the Yankees in his second start of the season. And last year, it really seemed like for most of the year, Tyler Wells was one of those guys that was getting innings, but he was getting them with kid gloves, where Mm -hmm. it was a lot of four-inning starts because he was often coming in somewhere in that 50 to 65 pitch range. Doesn't seem like they're worried about that anymore. So if you're going to let Tyler Wells work like a regular starter, I'm going to sign up for that, at least in matchups like this home one against the Tigers. Yeah, well, I was disappointed, uh, DVR, in your league. I not only uh, underbid on Bubich, but also on on Tyler Wells. Uh, I I did wind up with Drew Smiley of the... uh, weekly two uh two start week um, yeah drew smiley the patron saint of perpetual two start weeks <laughs> but i was yeah i was sad to uh, miss that on wells and it is very encouraging that he's going a little bit deeper it's understandable because last year he was coming off of having been a reliever i think all all of 2021 so last year he was in the rotation missed some time with injury started out very very briefly in, in the bullpen this year but uh yeah good to see that that's not holding him back from from throwing more pitches than his starts. I like the skill set. Um, not somebody who's going to necessarily give you a, a lot of strikeouts, uh, but I think he's a, a good ERA and, uh, and, and whip source, uh, a lot of, a lot of high infield flies. Um, so I think, you know, he's, he's likely to have a very low whip like he did last year. And um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, he's definitely worth uh, say uh three or four percent in 15 team leagues right now yeah i'm with you on that i just think very playable at this point and seeing just how cavernous the adjustments at camden yards were a season ago Mm -hmm. those home starts scare me so much less now for orioles pitchers than they did uh, pre-adjustments pre-2022 i think that was a park that i was really avoiding guys in for the most part uh, two start pitchers that I saw that were available, at least in shallow leagues. Corey Kluber was one who's off to a pretty bad start, a 692 ERA. He gets the Twins and then he gets the Brewers on the road. At least that Minnesota start comes at home. Uh, with this bad start, Al, what are you doing in leagues where Corey Kluber is available? Are you looking at him as a possible early season rebound candidate or are you looking at him as someone that you're trying to avoid because you're worried about picking up some, some uh, extra weight in those ratios? I'm out. <laughs> You're out on Kluber. I'm out. not not going to be bidding anywhere on Corey Kluber. Really, zero. Okay, yeah, fair. And and that and that's not even because I can say there's there's better options. I mean, the options are bleak. So yeah, you're looking at a, a one start Tyler Wells, uh, a one start Matt Strom. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm actually quite interested in picking up Matt Strom. But um, I know we talked about Dre Jason before. He's got pretty dicey matchups. I'll, I'll roll with him with the dicey matchups, at least, you know, skill wise. He's shown us a lot more this year than, than Corey Kluber has. If they were both available, who would you rather pick up than Nick Pavetta or Corey Kluber? Oh, you're going to make me do that. Um, yeah, yeah no, I'll go Corey Kluber. Oh, <laughs> that was not what I was expecting. <laughs> I, I thought you were going go to go to Pavetta. It's yeah, I probably answered that faster than I, I probably should have. Um, but yeah, my, my level of, of distrust of, of Pavetta just because of the consistency of year to year of not, you know, give, I, I like to think of the, t- the term that you used so nicely just a minute ago, uh, you know, being a drag or, uh, you know, not, not giving you very much uh, a fancy value. Um, I'll just, yeah, year to year, that that has been the case with Nick Pavetta. I mean, Corey Kluber even last year had his had some good moments. I think when you look at both of those guys, the rest of season projections, or the initial projections are really similar: high fours, even low fives, ERAs, bad WHIP. The difference for me is at least Nick Pavetta is going to give you strikeouts. You know you're getting sure. that. That's just there. So if I had to take a chance on one, I think I'd be more optimistic about Nick Pavetta at this point, which is. You know, it's a bummer that Corey Kluber's reached this point, but now I think he's got to be used very carefully. It's really the deepest of leagues. I don't know if we're seeing enough from Kluber to trust that we're going to get a bounce back in more shallow formats. I mentioned Peyton Battenfield earlier. If he stays in the Guardians rotation, he's at the Tigers. 
that might be pushing it just a little bit too far, though, Al. I, I think bad teams do score runs sometimes, and I think bad teams can score runs against starters like Peyton Battenfield. So um, I know you can throw just about anybody against that Detroit lineup right now, but I don't think I'm in a position in April where I feel like I'm desperate enough to do it. That's like the thing you do in August when your ratios are already hurt and you're just trying to rally back with some volume. I don't think it's something you have to do right now in the third week of the season. I agree. Uh, I had him in the initial draft of the uh, the waiver column, and then you know thought thought better of it. So he he was kind of on the borderline for me because of that matchup, but ultimately it does feel too risky. I've gotten burned too many times getting cute with with good matchups, and maybe I've learned my lesson by it this year. One more pitcher I think that I, I wanted to talk about is Ross Stripling is moving to the bullpen for the foreseeable future for the Giants, so they're going to go down to a five man rotation after starting with a six man rotation. That seemingly makes Anthony Descafani more safe. I still see Descafani as a, a spot starter, someone that you're going to use almost entirely at home and then occasionally for an easy road start. But in terms of job security, this is something that I think Disco kind of needed for me to trust him enough to pick him up in some places. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I didn't draft him anywhere, haven't picked him up anywhere, mostly because of the what I perceived as the rotation crunch. And I do wonder if Stripling will will come back. I mean, like you said, he's in the bullpen for the foreseeable future. But I came into this year thinking he was the the better pitcher of the two. So, um, but you know, now we're we're into the season and we're looking at you know streaming our last one or two starter spots. So. Uh, Desclafani, if you've got room to, to stash him, then you're not having to stream him off of waivers. I think he's good enough for that. Um, but yeah, and I wouldn't be counting on starting him more than every other week. Yeah, I think that's uh, an appropriate expectation at this point. Uh, I did see Kenta Maeda's Saturday start against the Yankees is being skipped for now. No IL. Louis Varlin is going to come up for the Twins. They're moving Tyler Malley back a day. So Malley's going to start on Saturday. Varlin will start Friday by the time many people get to hear this podcast. That start will already be in progress. Keep an eye on possible injury news in case they decide to give Maeda a brief stint on the IL. Doesn't sound like he'd be gone for long if they had to go that route. I did want to go back to some bats, though, because I felt like so there were some deep league hitters that sort of jumped off the page for me over the last couple of days. Uh, one with the Yankees, I think you got to mention on last week's show, Franchi Cordero continues to see regular time for them and we've seen the Yankees have some success in the late twenties bouncing around the league waiver claim minor league deal type players before. So it's not shocking. And of course is a left-handed bat with some power going into Yankee stadium for half of his games. That doesn't hurt Franchi Cordero's cause either. Uh, so in what types of leagues do you think Cordero is viable with the weekend approaching? I've already picked him up in a 12 teamer. So really? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the playing time for me is key. I just I was really suspicious that he would ever get a string of of starts, and uh, you know he has uh, in the past week. So um, yeah, that the stadium, that lineup. I mean, it's it's an ideal spot for him. So uh, and he's 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 on a heater right now. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how long it will last, but I definitely want to uh, take advantage of this in in any league that I can. So with the Franchi planning and bidding then, are you looking at it more as a temporary solution for this next week or two until Harrison Bader gets back from his oblique injury? Because once Bader's back, my expectation is that Bader plays almost every day because of his defense, and then you know, Judge is back in a corner. Is that how you see things sort of unfolding for Franchi, where once, once Bader comes back, Franchi goes back more into a part-time role? I think he'll lose some playing time, but I think um, Oswaldo Cabrera loses more. And that's the thing. I mean, uh, right now with the timing of it, I mean, Cabrera, unless he really goes ice cold very, very quickly. Uh, I mean, I, I think he's earned the uh, the chance to to start, start more often. So yeah, I, I think um, at that point, maybe he's, he's no longer 12 team viable, but I, I will be glad to have him still in 15 teamers. Let's talk about Brent Rooker, because I think if you're looking at Franchi, you're probably looking at Rooker. I think the way they're using him, he's been hitting in the cleanup spot the last few days, seeing an increase in playing time. That's pretty appealing. I think whereas Franchi could get squeezed a little bit, Rooker is kind of on his own. If he plays well, he keeps playing. If he struggles, he could be off the roster in four weeks or less. Like That's right. 100% 
in his range of outcomes. But the thing that really kind of stands out to me is Brent Rooker has enough power to hit home runs in Oakland. He has that kind of power. He's got a, a really high barrel rate in limited action as an up and down guy to this point in his young big league career. And he's not, he's not a plotter on the base paths either. He might actually steal a handful of bases. It actually kind of reminds me of the uh, Hunter Renfro skill set. Hmm. A little more swing and miss, and that's going to ultimately dictate, I think, whether or not this works for Brent Rooker. Uh, but are you throwing any bids in on him on, in 15-team leagues, just hoping to get enough playing time for him to fill a final outfield spot? Yeah, and I think that's exactly the the right niche for him. So, yeah, I'd probably be going maybe up to 20% to try to get Rooker this weekend. Uh, yeah, there's there's not a lot of obstacles there. So that's the, the upside of being in the A's picture instead of the Yankees pick, picture. Uh, you don't get the park or the lineup around you, but uh, – you definitely uh, have a better chance of getting a long run of, of playing time. So, uh, so yeah, and no, I think 15 teams, uh, and again, I'm not going to be breaking the bank, but uh, I, I think, he, you know, he's not just a mono league guy uh, with his opportunity w- with that, uh, with that power that he has. Yeah, as long as he doesn't have another multi-home run game this weekend, I think the bids will be limited. You could probably get two, three, 4%, something in that range in many leagues and, and come away with a guy that to this point in his career has a 50.6% hard hit rate. So Brent Rooker, in parts of the four seasons in the big leagues, has hit 172 batted balls, more than half above 95 miles per hour. It's a wow. 14% barrel rate. Not That's bad. impressive. And I also just want to go back to something that you said, which was not really an important part of your analysis, but just something that I, that I observed. You were saying maybe pick up some steals. And that was kind of my thinking with a lot of the hitters in the A's lineup. Uh, I think and that was, this is a conversation I think I had with Eno. That uh, you know, you know, said they could be the go-go A's, just trying to manufacture runs. They haven't been running that much. That was really <laughs> disappointing to me because I thought Langoliers maybe uh, he's actually pretty speedy for a catcher. I thought maybe he could pick up some steals. Um, yeah, somebody like Rooker, but uh, it's only been a couple of weeks. But so far, uh, that's not been the case. Yeah, so far, ten steals as a team. They're tied for ninth. Like there's five teams that have stolen ten bases so far. Uh, I think the issue with the A's, the thing that's going to keep them from being the go-go A's is not getting on base enough. they got a 300 OBP so far. Only the Royals and Tigers have been worse. But the Royals and Tigers have been a lot worse. The Royals have a 269 OBP as a team. The Tigers at 267. Absolutely brutal. So make sure you're streaming against the Tigers and the Royals until they show some signs of life, which they may never do. They may be streamable all year. I actually would expect them to be streamable all year. Uh, One other outfielder to think about in deeper leagues, I think of these three, he's the most likely to get bumped from the roster the quickest. It's Corey Jelks in Houston. I like this guy's swing. and I I was was looking at the skills uh, that we saw on display last year, old for the level at AAA, 31 homers, 22 steals. He was 22 for 27 as a base stealer last year. I don't know I, if if playing time stays open. If Michael Brantley has a setback, you know, at least in super deep leagues, I think there's a lot of ways Corey Jolks can help us. Uh, potentially, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a little discouraging that he still uh, does not have a stolen base this year. I mean, I say still, he's played in nine games, but you think maybe he would have you know at least one at this point. But uh, yeah, no, it's an intriguing skill set. It's a good lineup to be in. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's enough for him to be 15 team relevant. I think because of the potential short term nature, and, and you alluded to this right off the bat, DBR. But you know, because of that um, relative lack of job security, he's he's a one percent guy for me in in 15 team leagues. But definitely belongs there for somebody. Let's talk about a few fantasy zombies, as they've been called. I think that might be a, a Matthew Barry original guys that have just come back from the fantasy graveyard to have roles again. We'll dig deep. We started with middle infielders at the beginning of the show. I want to throw someone out there that could have some eligibility there again at some point. Kevin Smith up on the A's, the the A's team that I watch more than most people because their replays run when no other games are on. And I just happen to have the TV on all the time now. That's just my life. So could things be different for Kevin Smith this time around in Oakland after that fast start in Vegas? I mean, sure it could. And I, I'm sure there's a, a tendency that, that, you know, I'm not alone in, but when I saw that he was back up, I just thought, ah, I had such high hopes last year. That's I'm not going to get burned again. So when you have all the players 
that are potential, you know, 15 team in mono uh, waiver options, like we've been talking about for the last, you know, last several minutes. Uh, Smith definitely comes up short for me. I could see him as being a guy to, to fill a spot in an AL only right now, but I'm also kind of counting on other people having the same sort of response that I'm having and not having to, to bid on him with great urgency. I'm very nervous about him already because just in four games with the A's, he's already struck out seven times in 16 plate appearances. He's yes. gone right back to the problem he had in that brief time with the A's a year ago. So need to see some good decisions over this weekend series if I'm going to pick him up anywhere outside of AL only leagues. But interesting that he's back up because he was tearing the cover off the ball to start the year with the Aviators. How about Nick Senzel? He's back. And I saw that they shifted him into play second base for a little bit on Thursday night, to which I just replied, damn it, on Twitter. It, mostly because if Nick Senzel is finding playing time for the Reds, he will find his way onto at least one of my rosters. I just <laughs> The number of injuries he's dealt with and the position changes and just everything that's happened to him over the course of his career, he's... He's not like a typical 27-year-old in terms of the number of chances he's been able to have. I mean, we're still mm -hmm. talking about a 1,000 plate appearances for his career, 1025 to be exact. We've seen flashes of power and speed. This is a guy who was athletic enough to play up the middle in the infield and in the outfield. So I could see this actually working. He just came off the IL from a toe injury, so Will Benson got sent down in the corresponding move. Could we see Nick Senzel actually emerge to become useful in some leagues? Maybe. Uh, the thing that I usually think right off the top of my head uh, when I see any kind of development with the Reds hitter is, well, it doesn't take a lot of power to hit enough home runs to matter in fantasy. I mean, we saw that with, with Kyle Farmer when he was with the Reds. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of seeing it now with uh, TJ Friedel. And so it's like, well, if they can do it, you know, so can Senzel. The thing is that the one season where, you know, he did show that power was was 2019. And so I've just learned to kind of write that off when it's the outlier. Probably not fair with Senzel because of the, the injury history. So you can see I'm kind of going back and forth in my argument with him. Like, I do think there's still some potential there. I doesn't I don't think it takes a lot for him to be, you know, maybe a 10, 10, 15, 15 guy. Uh hitting hitting uh, in that park for his home games but you know there's there's a lot of negative to go with the with the positive so uh, i i could see bidding on him this weekend in 15 teamers but again it would be like a you know contingency one percent bid yeah so i think the problem i'm having with nick senzel is in 2019 when he put together the best big league numbers we've seen from him so far that was the 12 homer 14 steal season 414 plate appearances so it's like two-thirds of a season Mm -hmm. You could almost see a 2020 guy if you look at those numbers. That was the worst strikeout rate he posted as a big league hitter, but that was the best barrel rate that he had. And it seemed like maybe with a more aggressive approach, if that's what it was, he was doing a better job of hitting the ball hard, hitting the ball in the right angles. In the three seasons since, which again have been just marred by injuries and pandemic shortened year and all sorts of things, the barrel rate has been 4.2% or less. That is really low. Yeah, Around that, he's still hitting the ball pretty hard he's just still hitting on the ground too much so it's there but for some reason he hasn't been able to unlock it uh, i think if i'm if i'm choosing between senzel and, and kevin smith just throwing a dart in a really deep league i'd rather take the chance on senzel i, I think there's oh. still uh still something there there's a few ways it can go right i guess is mm -hmm. the way i'm looking at that and if i'm looking at him compared to victor robles he who usually is not named in this podcast I think I'd still prefer Nick Senzel to Victor Robles. Robles, uh, I said this about Luis Patino yesterday. The best thing going for Victor Robles, well, he's 25. So I guess anything's still possible. But I'm not buying this, Al. It, it was a good spring. It's a good start to the season. It's a 359, 444, 410 line so far. A couple of steals. Yeah, if you need cheap steals in a really deep league, maybe you could do worse. But one barrel so far and 35 batted balls that is right in line with his career norm that's exactly mm -hmm. what victor robles has done his entire career max exit velocity nope hasn't hit a ball harder than he has in the last five years that hasn't happened yet average exit velocity still garbage not highlighted in blue but still bad 85.8 <laughs> the k rate's low that's nice but I, if anything he's he's like the what's the best case scenario now for victor robles that he's just like this slasher that hits 280 or 290 with no power 
and steals 20 bases and plays enough because of his defense. Like that's, that's about it. What other well, path is there? That's yeah. That's not bad though. I would take that. And it's funny because those were exactly the numbers I had in my head. And, but you know, we're, we're hardest on the ones that we love DVR. And... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's not hitting 280 or 290 for a whole season, though. That's the part that I think is just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, no, I, I'm in uh, kind of uh, half of a state of shock here to to hear the the harsh assessment of Victor Robles. But um, yeah, I'm I'm with you that I would rather. There we go. Thank I you. Would, again I would rather have Senzel. Daniel. But every time I see uh, Robles sort of filling up the box score, you know, I, I'm thinking of of you and wondering what your reaction is and. Yeah, no, the power's not there, but um, the fact that he's in the early going here, I mean, the CSW is way down to like 20%. He's not striking out. Uh, it's a little interesting. I have more I, hope for him than you do, I think. I, I think there's a lot of people that have more hope for him right now than I do. I, <laughs> I'm not letting my heart get broken again. I have I've committed myself to letting other people enjoy any sort of mini post-hype breakout. I... I'm looking at the, the prospects report on his Fangraphs page, and I'm just I, I'm, I'm in disbelief. This is a guy that three, four years ago, back in 2019, had a 60 grade on his hit tool, 45 on his game power, which is fine for a speedy center fielder, 70 speed, 70 defense, 70 arm. And the arm's true. Like he's got a hundredth percentile arm strength on Statcast. He's a very good defender. I, I think what it is, it's like it's a similar profile to a guy that used to play in Washington, Michael A. Taylor, mm -hmm. who we thought for years maybe would find one more level and didn't. And the worst part is Victor Robles flashed that level one time and sucked a bunch of us in. I mean, 17 homers in 2019 and 11 homers in the four years since. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, I, I hold out a little hope. It's not a lot. But you know what? You brought up, brought up Michael A. Taylor, and I wrote a thing earlier this week about players who are hitting for a lot more power this year in the very, very early part of the season than they did uh, a year ago. And Michael A. Taylor, he uh, his max uh, exit velo is... Um, I'm sorry, not the max. The max is actually not that high, 107.9. But his average exit velocity is 91.5 right now, which is more than five miles an hour up from, from last year. 14.3% barrel rate. If we knew he was going to play enough, I might actually be interested in that. At least in AL only leagues, I think there's a, a useful pickup there for Michael Taylor where available. Let's get to some bullpens real quick before we go. I think the most intriguing arm that I saw available in a decent number of leagues going into this weekend was Jose Quijada, who now has two saves for the Angels this season. And I think Carlos Estevez, because of recent usage, was actually unavailable the mm -hmm. day that Quijada last closed out a game. Uh, Estevez had pitched three out of four days, so I, a lot of teams will often stay away from relievers in that scenario, much like they would uh, with three in a row. It's kind of the same thing, the, the way teams evaluate it. So is it a committee, or is it still one of those situational things that just looks a little askew because of how the early weeks of the season have played out? I mean, what, what's your interest level in Jose Quijada right now given how things have played out so far in Anaheim. It's it's not very high right now. Uh, I think it it seems like it should be a committee, the way that just that bullpen is assembled, but I'm not sure that it is. So I'm kind of assuming it's not. So, yeah, I, I would need to um, you know, maybe see how this plays out for at least another week before, before making a move. And I'm okay if I miss out on Quijada because of it, because um, I just... A lot of walks in past seasons... Uh, I just don't know that he's got the kind of skill set where he could take the job and, and run with it. Uh, I know that this is somebody who's not as widely available, but you know, for a couple of weeks running here, I've been sort of like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm willing to wait on saves, but I do want to try to get Andrew Chafin where I can this week, because I think he does have that job uh, in spite of being a lefty. And I think he'll be pretty good at it. Yeah. Maybe good enough to keep it. 2025 saves wouldn't be out of the question, even if they mix and match a little bit, because it does, it does seem like Tori Lavolo is not uh, committing to one closer, at least verbally, even if the usage yeah. kind of points to Chafin being the head of a committee. Uh, Joel Piamps had, had to close out a game for the Brewers because it went to extras, but the way they set up their bullpen in that game is pretty indicative of how I think they view the closer chair. It was mm -hmm. Peter Strzelecki, Matt Bush, and then Devin Williams covering the 7th, 8th, and ninth. 
It was Bush that served up a game tying home run in the eighth that took a save chance away from Williams. Williams did his job in the ninth, and then Piamps was just the best available reliever to close it out. So no need to pick him up. I think if something were to happen to Williams, I'd actually be more interested in Strzelecki. I think Strzelecki is better than Matt Bush. I don't think it's even particularly close. So uh, something to keep in mind if you can file uh, someone away in a really deep league that doesn't really get saves. It saves and holds leagues, even maybe P- Peter Strzelecki could be helpful there. Um, I was wondering if you're taking any uh, shots in the Yankees bullpen, just just more from a if something happens to Clay Holmes' perspective. Holmes has been good so far, four saves on the season, because uh, Ron Marinaccio is uh, out there in a handful of leagues, and he struck out 47.8% of the batters he's faced so far this season. Yeah, that's uh, that's good. Um, I Yeah. And, and as somebody who has Holmes in a few leagues, that's that's a would be a really good idea for me in particular to do i'm you know i wonder if you know michael king maybe uh would be part of a committee if if uh, the yankees had to replace Holmes for one reason or another so but uh yeah i i, I have to admit that uh, uh marachino is not on my was not on my uh radar for guys to pursue right now but i think that's a great call yeah just a really deep league stash nobody that i feel like you have to go get but just more of the who really gets saves? If, if Clay Holmes has to go on the IL, who's the guy for the Yankees? And and maybe it's someone else entirely, but I was just kind of surprised looking at those early season numbers that uh, we were seeing a K rate that high, even in a small sample. That was impressive. The Arsenal looks okay on paper. It's not an overpowering fastball, 93.9. Uh, it's really a fastball change combo with the occasional slider. So a little bit of a different Arsenal too, but just a name to throw out there for those in very, very deep leagues trying to find the future sources of saves. Uh, anybody else on your radar this weekend, be that in a bullpen or otherwise, Al? Oh, I mentioned Matt Strom. Uh, so I think I'll be uh, as aggressive on him as, as uh, probably anybody. And no, I mean, that's a, in terms of the, yeah, the bullpen uh, Chafin is going to be my target in 12 teamers and, and we've really, we've covered a lot of players. So I think we've covered just about uh, everybody else. Yeah, I think the other guy that I did pick up in our keeper league that ran overnight last night, uh, Johan Oviedo. Uh, I think there's a chance he's fine in the Pirates rotation for most of the season, coming off of a really nice outing against the White Sox, six and two thirds scores with five Ks, no walks. Control is going to be the the thing that makes or breaks him. If he keeps that walk rate down, I think there's going to be a lot of spots later on this year where Oviedo is at least streamable. Yeah. We'll see how the next couple of starts go, but I saw enough there. I think the Arsenal is interesting enough to take the chance and, and see if he can bump that K rate up just a little bit. We did see almost a strikeout per inning a year ago from him. Big fastball, averaging 96.4 on that fastball right now and, and getting a decent number of swinging strikes as well. So we'll see what is next for him. That is going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. As we go, a few reminders. You can get a subscription to The Athletic for $1 a month at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. You can read Al's weekly waiver column. You can read all of Eno's stuff. You can read everything we've got on the site. Fantasy baseball, real baseball, NFL drafts coming up. they got a Premier League season that's winding down. So tons of great stuff. And it's playoff time in the NBA and the NHL as well. So be sure to check that out. If you're not already a subscriber, you can find Al on Twitter at AlMelkierBB. You can find me at Derek Van Riper. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We are back with you on Monday.